History as we know it was never inevitable. Conventionally, I do videos about how events involving humans affect humans on an alternate path, but usually that's a time span of 2,000 years, at most. This is simply a snapshot, less than a single frame in the tale of life on Earth. And just like there was the fall of the Egyptians and Romans, there were the fall of dynasties of species, events out of individuals' control that changed the game and set the stage for new players to come in and effectively dominate the Earth. For example, in the Ordovician period, 485 million years ago, the Eurypterids, or giant sea scorpions, were the dominant predators of their day, along with 30-foot-long cephalopods called orthoconic nautiloids, growing larger than a full-size man, and hunting fish in the primitive seas. But eventually fish adapted, grew larger, and became the top predators themselves. Which is why I find paleontology and speculation surrounding it so fascinating. Sometimes there have been events in evolutionary history that decide which group will continue to be successful, diversify, and succeed, and which will be pushed to the fringes, having to wait their turn. The most famous of this, of course, is the fall of the dinosaurs. Non-avian dinosaurs held control over the Earth for 186 million years. For perspective, the Earth went from this to this in that time frame. Once the dinosaurs eventually dominated the Earth, their solid control forced mammals to remain small and scavengers. And once the dinosaurs were gone, mammals were able to take their place and fill the same roles that dinosaurs had before. So why am I talking about dinosaurs and mammals? Well, because the only reason the dinosaurs were able to take control for so long was because they rose out of the ashes of an extinction event far greater than even the asteroid that ended them. An event at the end of the Permian era that was so catastrophic, it ended roughly 83% of life on Earth, 96% of marine life, and 70% of vertebrates on land. It's often just called the Great Dying. Practically a reset on life. But what if the Great Dying never happened? Well, first, some context, if you were confused. At the end of the Permian, Pangaea had allowed for all forms of life to spread across what would become the continents we see today. However, reptiles themselves were diversifying. There's two main groups in this story that I want to focus on, the diapsids and the synapsids. Diapsids include reptiles that we see today, lizards, crocodiles, snakes, and most importantly for the story, what eventually became the dinosaurs. Synapsids split from the amniotes in the early Permian and started on their own odd path. They evolved different pairs of teeth, and their skull went from two holes to one. If you look at reptiles, they don't have a diverse set of teeth, instead it's pretty uniform. While the synapsids evolved teeth for chewing, cutting, and tearing. Canines, for example. Synapsids themselves split into smaller branches as evolutionary lines go, and soon there is a branch called therapsids. Animals that move with their legs under their body, as opposed to reptiles that got around on that classic sprawled position. Alright, got it? Stick with me on this. Just ponder that for a second. 250 million years ago, the world was full of a diverse set of creatures that were far more mammalian than reptile. The common conception was that mammals simply appeared out of nowhere during the Jurassic, but in reality, stem mammals, synapsid organisms, were the dominant creatures on Earth before the great dying wiped almost all of them out, forcing synapsids to remain small for the entire Mesozoic until an asteroid allowed them to reclaim that spot to today. So let's imagine an alternate timeline. The Great Dying simply doesn't occur. There is no massive series of volcanic eruptions in Siberia, and life continues on the path that it was going down during the Permian. So what now? Before the extinction, Diapsids were small, never growing larger than a cat, while the synapsids had evolved to take over most of the niches themselves. Therapsids of the Permian were a diverse group spanning millions of years. They varied especially from the start to the end. At first, they were far more reptile-like with scaly skin. However, as they evolved, it's theorized that they began to grow hair, at least on parts of their body, and were even warm-blooded. So without such an extinction, this path continues on. But instead of mammals evolving in the shadows of dinosaurs, they evolve alongside a large synapsid dynasty 
of similar related creatures. Going into what we'd think of as the Mesozoic, this isn't an age of dinosaurs, but an age of therapsids, and perhaps even mammals. For 150 million years, synapsids would have had a chance to diversify and rule instead. Now that we're speculating, could these alternate synapsids have reached the sizes of dinosaurs? Well, it's actually difficult to speculate because as of now, we don't know if therapsids actually laid eggs or not. They're really in a gray zone between our perceptions of a reptile and mammal. Their new alternate speculative size depends entirely on whether they had given birth to live young. Now, if they did lay eggs, then alternate Triassic therapsids certainly would have gotten pretty large. Maybe not as large as dinosaurs, but at least larger than the actual mammals we see today. The reason I'm bringing this up is placental mammals have to gestate and give birth to live young, which if you know anything about elephants, the larger the mammal, the longer the pregnancy. That takes a lot more energy for the mother to do, which is why when mammal babies are born, they don't grow to such ridiculous sizes. Since babies have to be born alive, this takes a lot more out of the mother. Dinosaurs didn't have to worry about this, considering they'd simply lay eggs and the embryos would develop into far smaller dinosaur babies. So let's say therapsids actually did lay eggs. Well, they still wouldn't reach dinosaur sizes, simply because of air sacs. Yes, really. Saurischians, the group that contains both sauropods and theropods, had air sacs inside their body just like modern birds of today. They were pretty much like balloons that allowed for the creatures to remain stable and keep themselves light. Without these, they probably would have been too large for Earth's gravity on land. The rapsids and mammals obviously don't have these, and because of that, even wildly large speculative alternate therapsids never would have reached the size of Titanosaurus. However, this doesn't mean that strange alternate body plans still couldn't have taken shape. In the 65 million years that mammals have had, we certainly have diversified into completely different shapes. And in this alternate timeline, it's no different with therapsids. Going into extreme speculative territory, I want to mention this, Suminia, a Permian therapsid that had opposable thumbs of all things. It's strange. This was a creature with a body plan of a primate hundreds of millions of years before primates. A strange example of convergent evolution, or when unrelated organisms separated by millions of years of ancestry evolve similar looking bodies due to their environment. Certain traits that are pushed by natural selection to be the most efficient in their environment. Just like whales, aquatic reptiles, and fish all of all fins despite not being related, so too did this non-mammalian therapsid evolve thumbs to climb the Permian trees. Of course, the full extent of this even today is purely speculation on what the creature actually looked like. Maybe it had fur, maybe it didn't. But let's have our imaginations run even more wild on if conditions were different. How this lineage would have evolved over the same time frame the dinosaurs would have had. Perhaps it evolved into a similar body plan as apes, if conditions allowed it. I know, this is entirely speculative and crazy, but it's an interesting thought. The odd thing is, even if the therapsids still had their hundreds of millions of years in the sun, it wouldn't have lasted. No matter what, there are two events I certainly could predict would have happened. The continents would move, and an asteroid 65 million years ago still hits the Earth. An asteroid was going to cause an extinction event, no matter what. Because of orbital mechanics. The movement of bodies in space is actually one of the things we can accurately predict, because there are just so few factors. So no matter if there was a Permian extinction or not, and no matter who was the dominant life on this planet, that rock is still coming. Diapsids, just as they had been since the Permian, had remained small organisms. With all the niches filled for so long, they, much like our mammal ancestors in our timeline, relied on escaping large predators and scavenging. With this asteroid, though, everything changes. That rock that spelled doom for them in our timeline now becomes their greatest opportunity. With the same size extinction event, the larger therapsid organisms are wiped out by the blast or simply starved to death, leaving the smallest, just like in our timeline, to rise up. Their Earth's climate following the next tens of millions of years after the asteroid hit is far warmer than our Earth of today. Forests stretch all the way into the Arctic, and it's in this time that the archosaurs now have a chance to fill the niche left behind by the mammals. 
There is a twist though. If non-avian dinosaurs did rise, they'd be living in a colder, drier, and more divided world. As the forests disappear and grasslands take over, this would severely limit the size that they would grow to compared to our own timeline. There would be no need for sauropods to grow to such heights if the food they needed was mostly on the ground. Or perhaps natural selection in certain areas would encourage a whole new stranger body plan of dinosaur to populate this world. One that only eats grass much like the ungulates and deer of our own timeline. With the Ice Age arriving, dinosaurs would probably not have a difficult time surviving. They, just like birds, were warm-blooded and could have regulated their own body temperature. Feathers have been proven to be just as efficient in insulation and regulating heat as fur, so the dinosaurs would probably be able to survive in this colder world. Natural selection would probably encourage longer feathers and more prominent coats to evolve. Imagine you Tyrannus of our timeline. This like all of my videos, is simply speculation. Evolution and the change of life is such a complex topic that it's impossible to say if something would have happened with 100% certainty. The best we can do is see the patterns that life takes to adapt to its conditions. There is only one thing that we do know. Every extinction, every catastrophe, and every shift in the balance of life led to us. Had the Permian extinction never happened, you probably wouldn't be here watching this video. In a lot of ways, it's thanks to random volcanoes in Siberia, which pumped so much gas into the air that it basically collapsed the environment. This is Cody of Alternate History Hub. Special thanks to my paleontologist friend Matt for helping me out on this video. This is a new topic for me, so I appreciate him discussing this scenario and checking over the script. So, thanks Matt.